central banks around the world throwing money into the marketplace. And as long as you have that, you've got uh, speculative buying that's taking place. It's the money going in, the, the QE, and you know everything that's happening globally that way is is really in my mind a big Ponzi scheme that's government funded. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not helping the economies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's disrupting the markets. But the money has to go somewhere, and so people are finding places to put it in, into equities. And what you have with QE is is simply a monetary phenomenon where money is going in. And if you have more money, and it's helping to offset what mm -hmm. businesses and and people are doing as far as debt liquidation. That money's going to find a home, and it's finding a home in the financial markets. Mike, good to have you with us here on Bloomberg. Thank you. Just first, got to ask you, why did you write this book? Uh, I'd been hearing so many investment myths over the 30 years that I've been trading that it just bubbled up in me, and I felt I had to get the truth out about what's really a myth and what's really true in investing. The title came out of um, when I was writing the book, it was exposing 20 common investment myths. And as I'm writing them, I started realizing what they were really doing in, with these myths was people were, the common investment wisdom was teaching people to gamble with their money, to take unnecessary risks. Mm -hmm. And to me, the definition of jackass investing is taking unnecessary risk with your money. So Brandywine takes a, an entirely different approach than the asset class approach that most people take. So you, you'll find most institutional investors and investors in general that are looking at um, asset classes, equities, bonds, and within that they have different sectors and categories they're looking at. We really take a, a return driver based view where we're saying what are the individual opportunities at, at every level of every market and not just limiting it to equities or, or bonds for example. So we, we look at anything across commodities mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as within the equity markets. You know our approach is really to look at more of a micro bottom up right. independent opportunities and, and trends could be one component of that but yeah. there's there's dozens of return drivers that we employ. So you could look at market sentiment for example. Yeah. Um, you, you could look at cost of production data on commodities and determine whether or not there's opportunities with certain markets in that so scenario. Today we're totally fu uh, futures focused, uh, managed futures and the reason we are is because we can trade over 100 markets globally with mm -hmm. one instrument type mm -hmm. in futures. Uh, it's very liquid to go long and short. So we're in commodity markets, we're in currency markets, stock indexes around the world, uh, bonds and money markets around the world, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 100 different markets. And uh, mm -hmm. it allows us to get the, the best diversification, mm -hmm. which gets the highest return at the lowest level of risk. So my approach philosophy is to identify return drivers that have solid long-term probability of driving the returns of any given market mm -hmm. and then systematically back testing to find out whether they are effective and mm -hmm. then employing those on a systematic basis going forward. The, the last myth I put in the book, there is no free lunch, it, that's, that's the myth that you can't earn a higher return with less risk. And the reason that's a myth and the reason it's not a fact, but the reason people believe it to be truth is because they start with a boxed in universe of investment options. And they say, well, if I stay within this box, I, I want to get more return, I have to leverage it up some, and I'm going to take on more risk. And what I point out throughout the entire book is that there are numerous trading strategies involved in numerous investment areas outside of what's conventional, like a 60-40 stock split. And when you expand beyond that into those other areas, you can actually increase your return and lower your risk at the same time. Mm -hmm. The belief is that to get additional <coughs> return, you have to take on necessary and additional risk. Mm -hmm. and <clears throat> That's absolutely not true. And the reason the belief exists, though, is because people are taught to gamble with their money. They're taught to put a little bit of money in uh, stocks, a little bit of money in bonds, maybe some money in real estate. And within that small box, if you want to get a higher return, you do have to take on more risk. Right. But if you expand beyond that box, and if instead of looking at each of these asset classes, and I talk about asset classes in the book, you instead look at return drivers and diversify your portfolio across return drivers, mm -hmm. you can get better returns and mm -hmm. reduce risk. That, that's really a, a theme, probably a central theme running through the book, is yeah. that diversification is the one true free lunch. Mm -hmm. Portfolio diversification. And don't commit to any one style of trading or any mm -hmm. one return driver. It, it'll work for a while, just like owning stocks. The return driver of really betting on people's emotion and increasing yeah. desire to own stocks worked great for 20 years. And, yeah. and, but everybody then started gravitating to relying on that single return driver. Mm -hmm. It's going to fail. They, no single return driver works all the time. You have to diversify. And what about this idea that so many people are just long? They just buy and they hold and they think that that will take care of itself. Yeah, buy and hold works well for long-term investors is 
my second myth in the book. Indeed. And it, it's just it's just not true. I mean, just like in any other environment, uh, I, I view it as a an excuse to rationalize losses. It, on average, people do mistime the market. Uh, most investors are emotional. Market's going up. They're jumping in. The market starts selling out. They're they're panicking and they're selling out of their holdings. Fear and greed. It, absolutely, and they're they're doing everything at the wrong time. And when you look at the studies, you can see that that over the last 20 years, the average investor investing in mutual funds has underperformed by 5% a year the exact same mutual funds performance that they invested into. So that shows you that after the funds run up, they buy, after the funds sell down, they, they sell. There's a study in there that was done at Yale where they had a rat find which side of a maze to go to to find the food. Mm -hmm. And it was 60% on one side and 40% on the other. And then they had the, the students, the Yale students, make the same prediction. Mm -hmm. The Yale students got it wrong more often than the rats did. <laughs> the rats, because they started figuring out most of the time it was over here, yeah. they got close to 60% right. Uh -huh. the, the Yale students were close to 50-50. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. sometimes being an expert, overthinking, yes. you underperform. Well, I got to ask you about today's market action when it comes particularly to the U.S. Treasury. The rally just continues. What do you make of this herd that wants to own bonds at 1.5%? It, it's the riskiest trade out there because if you're a, if you're trying to re receive a return on your money and you need 5%, you're guaranteeing you will not make that return by investing in U.S. Treasuries at 1.5%.